uh, for instance, with me, he was uh, absolutely grandfather, like any other grandfather, would uh, play games with me and we would tease each other and uh, <laughs> give me lessons and look at my lessons and all those things. And yet, the next moment he would switch over and go to negotiations for the independence of India. Like my grandfather, I suffered a lot of uh, discrimination and uh, beatings, physical beatings. Mm -hmm. uh, because of color. They had a lot of trade with Japan, so they couldn't uh, discriminate against them, so they treated them as honorary whites. Now, in 1960, these people were in such dire poverty that they had never eaten a square meal in their lives. They just survived on scraps of food that they got from the garbage. They had never tasted milk in their lives. They had no clothes to wear. Very often we would go to um, their little huts to visit them and the women would talk from inside and uh, not open the doors to us. And then, then we found that because they didn't have any clothes, they couldn't come out and speak to us. Arun Gandhi tells us about his famous grandfather Mahatma Gandhi and what it's like to live in apartheid in South Africa and under the caste system in India. Right now on Alternative Views. Mr. Gandhi is the director of the M.K. Gandhi Institute for Nonviolence in Memphis, Tennessee, and is the grandson of M.K. Gandhi, who led India to independence through his nonviolent social change. Did, uh, did you know uh, your grandfather very well? Yes, I was very lucky. I had the opportunity of living with him when I was uh, 12 years old in 1946. And I have some very vivid memories of that time. And uh, I am now, in retrospect, I am always very puzzled how he could manage to, uh, you know, divide his attention to so many different things at different levels. Uh, for instance, with me, he was uh, absolutely grandfather, like any other grandfather, would uh, play games with me and we would tease each other and uh, <laughs> give me lessons and look at my lessons and all those things. And yet, the next moment he would switch over and go to negotiations for the independence of India with the uh, British leaders and other leaders there. And. Um, yeah, it, you know, when I think back at all those little things that happened during that period, I really am, feel very um, happy that I was given that opportunity because I think in many ways that one year, more than a year that I had with him, helped me understand his philosophy and mold my life and thinking as an adult. And there are, you know, he had this knack of explaining his philosophy using uh, minor everyday occurrences. Um, I can share a few of them with you. Yes, One of them related to uh, a little pencil. And now you'll wonder what a little pencil has to do with the philosophy of nonviolence. But uh, I was given a pencil and a notebook to do my lessons with. And one day, like most children, I threw away the pencil when I thought it was too small. Went to grandfather and asked him for a new pencil. And he says, um, he started questioning me. Where is the pencil you had in the morning? Why do you need a new pencil? 
why did you throw it away and all sorts of things and I couldn't convince him that uh, that was too small <laughs> ultimately he uh, told me to go out and look for the pencil and so I used the excuse I said it's getting dark outside it's late in the evening so he says he has a flashlight <laughs> And uh, so he made me go out and look for that pencil for nearly two hours and bring it to him. <laughs> and then he made me sit next to him and he said, now I'm going to explain why I did this. And he said, I want you to learn two lessons from this. One is that even in the making of a little pencil, a lot of natural resources of the world are used. And if all of us, millions of us, go around wasting pencils like this, imagine how many, uh, how much of natural resources we are wasting. And we have no right to do this. Now it amazes me that he was thinking about environment and ecology in 1945-46 when that wasn't even an issue. I don't think even anybody knew the word uh, environment and ecology. but. That was one lesson that he wanted me to learn. He says, however small or however insignificant it may seem to you, never get into the habit of wasting things and destroying things. Use it to the ultimate. The other lesson was that uh, there were millions of children around the world who lived in such abject poverty that they didn't have even these little things to use. There. So we ought to be doubly careful about uh, all the things that we get and uh, we are privileged to have so that uh, if we don't waste we would be able to share with many more people. What kinds of things did your grandfather like to do for fun uh, like the games you would play? What type of things would make him laugh for instance? Oh, He would laugh at many things. He had this great sense of humor and uh, I remember when we used to go out for walks in the morning and evenings and, and he always had had the habit of keeping two people close to him and he would lean on their shoulders, keep his arms on their shoulders mm -hmm. and walk. That. And um, very often just um, while walking, you know, he'd suddenly lift up his legs and hang on your shoulders. <laughs> and if you're not, uh, not you know, aware of this and uh, you're taken by surprise, <laughs> you could collapse on his leg. <laughs> He would play such games, and sometimes he had a walking stick along with him, and uh, I would be holding the stick in front and playing horse, and he would be sort of running after me, riding, you know. And <laughs> all very uh, commonplace uh, games, and but he, uh, he had a great sense of humor. I know when we used to sit and spin, very often we used to sit and spin together, you know, the hand machine, oh. spinning cotton. Uh -huh. Which was part of his Which philosophy, was part of his philosophy. independent from Britain. Right. And uh, he wanted the people methods. to produce their own right. cloth and, and use it, so right. he used to do that. And, and very often when he was spinning, I would find myself free and I would join him and then we would have a competition to see who spun the thinnest yarn and who spun the most yarn in one hour and all those things. You know. mm -hmm. yeah. Did he talk much or did he tell you about some of the things that were happening in his life at the big level, national and international level? Sometimes he would talk about it, uh, not directly alone with me, but uh, when we sat in a group or something and uh, he would express um, some of his uh, feelings about it but uh, I guess I was too small at that time 12 years old for him to confide in me or anything <laughs> like in that. terms of the political yeah. how did you become aware that this was your grandfather's philosophy that nonviolence was the key to social change well during that year I saw how he used the philosophy and how he uh, taught people and he would teach me also using everyday instances and uh, but it was never like a lesson it was no, never you know uh, when you sit down and, and he lectures to you or anything like that it was just in the course of the day when uh, things were happening he would use a, any particular instance and then uh, give you a little story on that and and tell you why that is important in his philosophy and all. So that's how I got some of the basic training but I was fortunate that 
my parents, uh, my father was his second son, and uh, my mother, they had devoted their lives to his work in South Africa. And uh, so they were conducting um, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa in a non-violent manner. So I got much of the later training through them. And then, of course, I used it myself in several uh, situations, and I found that it was very practical. So I would say that it was a gradual process that went on uh, over the years, you know. And, uh, I just began to learn and appreciate more and more of his philosophy. Did his death have a big impact on your life? Did it change it much? Yeah, it was very shocking. I mean, uh, when it came so suddenly, you know, and um, I couldn't imagine anybody wanting to kill a person like him. I mean, you know, I, it, it was unthinkable. And when that news came to me, I just couldn't believe it. None of us could go for the funeral. And father was very um, disturbed by that. But we used to bring out a weekly newspaper called The Opinion. It was a paper that was started by grandfather in 1903. Right, he had experiences earlier in South yeah. Africa. Mm -hmm. So um, father decided to bring out a special issue on uh, commemorating grandfather. And we all got involved in, in that. And uh, since this was a self-operated, hand-operated printing press where we had to pick up the alphabets and uh, set them A, B, C, D and make the words there, I got my grounding in, uh, in this printing press at a very early age. And I started helping in various ways. So by 14, I was uh, already quite into it and able to help my parents bring up, bring out this uh, weekly paper. And so you ended up then staying in South Africa for the next years. And my father died in 1956, and I went to India after his death to uh, immerse his ashes in the the rivers in India. And there I met uh, my wife and we decided to get married. And the South African government said that uh, I can come back alone, but I can't bring my wife with me. Oh my goodness. Uh, there were two main reasons for this. One of it was that they were always very keen on getting rid of the Gandhi family mm. from South Africa. <laughs> yeah. Because they were a thorn in their flesh. And they felt that this was a good opportunity because father had just died and I was the only male member. And they thought that if they didn't allow me to come back, then my mother and my two sisters would follow me to India and, and they would be rid of the family. But I guess they didn't count on the resilience of the Gandhi women. <laughs> they decided to stay on and continue with the work in, in South Africa. At that time in South Africa, were the people from India treated differently from the blacks in South Africa? They were put into a separate category, were they not? Yeah, well, uh, they, they really perfected this divide and rule policy in South Africa. And so the Indians, the uh, black Africans, and the uh, coloreds, the mulattoes, who weren't classified as coloreds, Everybody was treated separately, everybody had different set of laws, but everybody was generally treated as a non-white. The South African uh, system was classified into four categories. The first were the whites, and the whites were of two types. There were the British descendants and the Afrikaner descendants. The Afrikaner were slightly more in number. and. Uh, for many years, they had been subjugated by the British, so there wasn't very really good relationship between them either. Well, the British had defeated but, them in the Boer War. Yeah, right. But they were rid of Dutch descend uh, ascendancy, I understand. Mm. But uh, right up to 1948, the British controlled South Africa. And mm. 1948 was the first time the Nationalist Party, made up of Dutch people, came into power. Uh, so they were the first group, and then came the coloreds. The coloreds were the mulattoes, the mixture of blacks uh, and whites, or the 
Malays in Cape Town. They had imported a lot of people from Malay, uh, Malaysia. And uh, so there was a mixture of them with the whites and a mixture of many other uh, races with whites. Uh, so they were all classified as coloreds. So they came the sec in the second group. The third group were the Indians, and the fourth group were the local African tribes. Mm. Now, where did the uh, Asian people, the Chinese, the Japanese, you, you, you said the Japanese were yeah, well, honorary uh, whites. Yeah. Where did the other a Asians come in? Uh, they, they all were all in the same group as the Indians. There were not too many of the other Asians. There. Mm. The Japanese yeah. were in a higher category than the Chinese or the Koreans? Yes, yeah, that was for trade purposes. <laughs> They had a lot of trade with Japan, so they couldn't uh, discriminate against them, so they treated them as honorary whites. That was the classification given to them, honorary whites. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember any particular experiences there that were... Yes, I was. In fact, like my grandfather, I suffered a lot of uh, discrimination and uh, beatings, physical beatings. Mm -hmm. um, or because of color. In South Africa, you uh, experience hate and discrimination and oppression almost at every step when you're walking down the streets. And anybody could uh, insult you. And, you know, I remember one instance, I was sitting in the car waiting for my father to return, uh, parked on the side there, and it was very close to the, a bar. And a white uh, walked out from the swaggering. He was drunk. And he was clearly a, a hobo. He didn't have anything to do. And he comes around to me and he says, uh, hey, give me a bob. That's a shilling. Mm. So I said, I'm sorry. And the fellow started insulting me. And, and there was a policeman standing nearby, and I told the policeman, I said, look, this fellow is harassing me, and I don't like it. So the policeman turns around on me, and he says, if you don't like it, get out of here. What are you doing here, sitting here for? He doesn't tell that man anything, but he tells me to get out from there. You know, that sort of thing is all the time you just have to bear with it or, or keep fighting it. All and, and what about organized struggle? Were you involved in a movement for social Yeah, my father there? was my father was involved in movements and uh, as I said, we family members were always involved with our parents in um, various aspects of the movement. So we did uh, defy. Of course, I was still young, so I wasn't taken to prison. But my father was taken to prison mm -hmm. very often and I think he spent about, in all, uh, about 16 to 17 years of oh his life God. in prison. Well, like Nelson Mandela, mm -hmm. the same sort of arresting the leaders yeah. of the movement. And Except that it wasn't at one stretch, it was mm -hmm. at different times. Right. And what types of things would he be accused of, of doing? What did he do? To well, he just, uh, he just defied apartheid wherever he saw it. And, and, uh, Plus his newspaper, I guess. Plus his know. newspaper, plus writing in the newspaper. Were there multiracial, multicultural organizations which were forming to try to uh, provide this uh, front against the apartheid? Yeah, not until the 60s, uh, no, not the 60s, I think in 50, 52. Around 52 was the first time when the uh, the African National Congress, the Indian National Congress, and the Colored People's Congress, three of them came together and held a common conference. And they said, let's make common cause and fight together instead of separately. And um, that was the first time they decided. Then, but it didn't last very long because. Uh, they decided it was going to be a non-violent struggle and uh, and then they couldn't find a common law that affected all three of them together you know apartheid law and um, so that was a big problem and eventually when they did find one one or two of them and they went and defied those laws the government played a very cl a clever trick on them. They gave each group a different uh, jail sentence. And the African group suffered the most for breaking the same law. 
And the African was sentenced to uh, one year's hard labor. The Indian was sentenced to one month's hard labor. And the colored person was sentenced to um, one week or something like that, you know. It was ridiculous, I think. So very quickly they broke up that coalition. Mm -hmm. and, um, but loosely they continued to function together in, in a very sort of loose fashion. How would you compare the caste system in India with apartheid in South Africa? Well, it's the same thing, you see, like in South Africa, the whites were the superior. It was always a vertical uh, division of people, and the whites were at the top. And in India, the Brahmins uh, were at the top, and, uh, and then the, uh, the Kshatriyas um, and the Vaishyas at the Sudras. These were the four uh, classifications. And so the whites, they're the coloreds, the Indians, and the uh, blacks, and each one of them um, discriminating and oppressing the, those below them. So that's exactly what happened in India also with the caste system. The three upper caste people would always oppress the low caste, and the, you know, it was... Uh, so I, I find many, um, many parallels in the situation there. I also found many parallels in the way the whole system was uh, created to oppress people and, uh, and how that was perpetuated uh, through all these years. Of course, in India, it's been there for more than uh, 2,000 years. Earlier in, in India, before the birth of Christ, uh, there was this caste system, but there was mobility up and down. There was no rigid, uh, uh, you know, blockages. Mm -hmm. And so a person at the very bottom of the ladder, if he or she had the opportunity, they could move upwards or the person from the top could come down. And there was that freedom to move up and down. Was that mainly be by economic... Uh... Yeah, a uh, caste system is based on professions, mm -hmm. mainly based on professions. So but it's fixed from family to, or generation to generation. That's what happened around the birth of Christ 2,000 years ago when uh, we had um, who is described as a Hindu law maker, Manu. Um, whether he was a king or he was just a, a somebody who, who made the laws, I don't know. Uh, it's not very clear there, but Manu laid down the laws uh, around the time of the birth of Christ when he made uh, caste hereditary. And he said, henceforth, uh, you know, it'll, your caste will be determined by birth. And um, the, that's where all the discrimination and oppression came in. It freezes uh, the socioeconomic class yeah, hierarchy. Yeah, right. So you couldn't do anything to get out of it. There was absolutely nothing you could do to get out of it, and that's where the whole thing, all the uh, unpleasantness came in. And it's still that way today? It's still that way. Unfortunately, I think Grandfather expected the government to abolish the system at all, altogether uh, and, um, and, you know, help uh, people to get over that uh, thing. But they what would? they ended up doing is they just uh, made it illegal to discriminate against somebody on the basis of caste or religion or race or, or gender. Mm -hmm. The low caste uh, people who were uh, discriminated against, they had to go and prove to the, um, the police and the courts of law that they have been oppressed or discriminated. And these people didn't have the means, they didn't have the education, they didn't have the finances to do these things. And also, very often, the person who oppressed them or discriminated against them was their employer. So they couldn't very well go and institute legal mm. proceedings against somebody who's providing them bread and butter. They, You'd also so, you probably know. have to go up before a judge who was at a higher caste. Yeah, right. So, yeah, all of these things put together, they never did institute any cases there. And so <laughs> you go to India today and the Indian government will give you statistics to show that there are no cases of discrimination in India. Because yeah, but that's only half the truth because nobody has instituted the proceedings. So how can there be any statistics of cases there mm. at all? 
Did uh, Nehru try to bust the caste system? Were there any progressive social changes under his rule? He was the, one of the lieutenants of your grandfather who was taken to be one of the more progressive of the uh, Indian socialist national and, and Indian nationalists for independence and was quite a distinguished uh, person, ruled India for a long time. Did he not make an effort to follow your grandfather's uh, teaching in terms of eliminating the caste system or was he a disappointment? Well, I, I personally was very disappointed with him. I thought that he would do much more in this field to do, uh, to break the caste system there, but obviously he didn't do it. And uh, I think the only reason I can find there is that uh, at the time of independence, more than 99.9% .9 of the government and the bureaucracy was made up of the two upper caste people, the, the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas, Nehru himself was a Brahmin, and so they didn't want to threaten their own uh, existence. And and so the only thing they t ended up doing is, uh, uh, like I said, and putting it in the Constitution that uh, they will have equal rights and they will not be discriminated. Just as we did with the blacks here in the United States, they were gr granted civil rights but that was all. Now legally you can do all these things, but then to implement that in, in real life, it's very difficult. We see that in the United States also, and we see it in India, that uh, we are not able to translate the law in, in everyday life there. So the uh, actual integration of the people hasn't taken place. Now, Indira Gandhi, for many years, was also the Prime Minister, the ruler, President of uh, India. What's the relationship between your family and Indira Gandhi's family, and what is your sense of her to the extent that she did or did not follow the legacy of your grandfather? Well, first of all, let me say that she wasn't related to us right. in, in any way at all. Uh, in fact, she was very astute uh, in misleading people not only in India but outside uh, about this relationship. And let me explain this. Uh, the Gandhi that she married is, uh, was a descendant from Iran, uh, known as a Parsi. And they used to spell their name. They did have the fa family name Gandhi, but they used to spell it very differently. It was G-H-A-N-D-H-Y. And um, she changed it uh, to the Hindu spelling of the name <laughs> to confuse people, and she got she got uh, that you know she did, she was able to do that, and so a lot of people everywhere in the world today think that she was directly related to the Gandhi. So to that extent, she uh, used Gandhi's name, uh, but unfortunately, she didn't do anything. Uh, concrete or progressive uh, to implement his philosophy. I don't think she really believed in anything very much. She was just a politician. She out was a power. politician. She was out for power. And uh, she was one of those um, people who believed that Gandhi uh, wasn't uh, realistic, that his, his ideas of cottage industry and all that were outdated and, and they were not the answer to India. But that was because they approached his philosophy dogmatically. And um, and I think that that was a great injustice to Gandhi because he didn't expect anybody to follow him dogmatically. He wanted people to uh, evolve uh, from his philosophy and build up on that. And, and I think that uh, although he did talk so much about cottage industries and things like that, but that he was talking in terms of the 30s, 20s and 30s India. Um, and if he was living today, I'm sure he would have accepted many other things in his philosophy. Now, when uh, did you leave um, South Africa to return to uh, India? Uh, what year? And you weren't allowed to go back to South Africa then? Mm -hmm. And so what were some of your experiences then in India? Was this in the 1950s? Yeah, as I said, I, I left South Africa in 56 after 56. my father's death. and. Um, and, and we married in uh, 58, early 58, 
and they wouldn't allow me to come back with my wife. So I decided to stay on in India. And I had to get a job as a journalist in Times of India. And then um, in um, early 60, both my wife and I decided that along with our normal work and livelihood, we ought to be doing some social work also to help people. So we began to get involved in things. and. My wife got involved with the uh, status of battered women in India and uh, um, abandoned children. Both of these problems are very acute in India. We have lots of uh, battered women and uh, many abandoned children. And then from that we got involved in uh, the caste, the low caste untouchables. And that's when we uh, really started implementing some of grandfather's philosophies of nonviolence in in helping these people. Uh, first of all, it was an experiment. We, we ourselves were not very sure whether this would work or not. We had heard it in theory, but we had never seen it mm -hmm. in practice, so we decided to put it in practice. We adopted one village of more than 260 untouchable families, about 200 miles south of Bombay. And um, we had to spend a lot of time trying to get uh, accepted by them. Uh, they had been exploited so much that they bega became suspicious of everybody. They didn't uh, want anybody to come and exploit them further. So for several months we had to go every day and speak to them and, and you know, make our uh, case to them. And ultimately they did accept us and once they did then we started um, taking them into confidence as grandfather suggested, we started working out programs, what what were the priorities that they needed and how could we help them in this. And it was very clear that economic uh, stability was one of the prime importance there. So we had to find ways of giving them economic stability. Now, in 1960, these people were in such dire poverty that they had never eaten a square meal in their lives. They had just survived on scraps of food that they got from the garbage. They had never tasted milk in their lives. They had no clothes to wear. Very often we would go to um, their little huts to visit them and the women would talk from inside, uh, not open the doors to us. And then, then we found that because they didn't have any clothes, they couldn't come out and speak to us. So that was the level of poverty that we found there. But uh, we took advantage of some of the government programs. You know, at that time, the government was very keen on uh, developing the dairy industry because there was big demand for milk in the cities. So they were giving liberal loans to people to buy animals and produce milk and sell that milk to the mother dairy and all that. So we asked these people to go and apply for those loans. But when they did so, the government refused, mm -hmm. saying that you don't have any collateral. Oh my. And um, so we had to stand uh, sureties for them, get them the loans, and they each got a, an animal per family. And that was the first time that they tasted milk, and that vision is still there in my mind, you know, when they first got the milk from the, the animal. And, and they took the first sip there. I mean, it was so, in a sense, it was you know, pathetic that people, a, a common thing like milk was never given to some people. But uh, it was a very moving experience. And then they began to sell that milk to the government and that became an income for them. And um, from that, we helped them develop an agricultural cooperative. And through these uh, cooperatives, in about eight or nine years, we transformed the economic base of that um, village totally. They began to get steady income and, and a sizable income uh, every month. And they began to eat well and, and you know, wear clothes and uh, send their children to schools and, and all those things. And, and uh, you could see that transformation in them. 
And then we induced them to um, save some money for various programs of their own, like medical facilities and scholarships and, and things like that. And then there was another big problem there in that, in that whole area. Um, you know, because of poverty, the, the agents used to come from the cities and buy young girls to take them away into prostitution. Mm -hmm. And they would buy these girls for $12 and $15, and uh, they were gone. You know, at the age of 10, 12, mm -hmm. they, they went and they never came back again. Of course, they told the parents that they were taking them to the city and going to give them jobs and all that in somebody's homes. But in actual fact, they were taken to prostitution. So we wanted to put an end to that. And we told these people, I said, now you must ensure that nobody uh, reaches that stage of uh, desperation, that they have to sell their daughters into prostitution. And you set aside some money for that. And they did that. And uh, they also created a volunteer group of young men who would scour around the villages in that area and see that nobody ever sold their daughters. And whenever anybody was in a desperate need of money or something, they would help them through this fund. Mm. So since 1973, uh, they stopped the sale of girls in about... Um, nearly 200 villages in the neighborhood. That's remarkable. And, uh, and not only that, but then, you know, we had inspired them all along that they should not become selfish, that once they have attained economic stability, they should be willing to help other people. So they are now doing that. Um, they are very well off economically now, and uh, in all these years, the young people have gotten education and come back and are running their businesses very well. But they are also, uh, you know, in, uh, helping other young people in the neighboring villages. Um, you know, set up economic uh, programs there. And so this uh, economic uh, program of theirs is now expanded to about 300 villages mm. and covers about a half a million population. That's remarkable. And this is yeah. independent of the government of India, right? Oh, yeah, totally independent. People yeah. organizing themselves. Uh -huh. Well, this was the beauty of Gandhi's philosophy of nonviolence. Mm. It was a m more positive philosophy, not just a protest philosophy. It wasn't protest movement alone, but if you got involved in something, you didn't like something, do positively to change that, you know. And create an alternative. And create an alternative. Right. So that's, that's where we really found the, um, the uh, strength of this philosophy when we saw the results in this village and how in a very short time just seven of us using, giving our part-time help because all seven of us had to work for our livelihood. And the only thing we did was to sacrifice our uh, uh, vacation time and a little free time and, uh, and go there and help them and advise them and do things for them. Apart from that, we didn't really do anything very much. But even that little help could transform the lives of so many people there. What is the legacy of your grandfather today in India and around the world? Well, I would say in, in many ways, in many senses, I think he's more respected outside India than he is inside India. Um, hmm. Inside India, very few people now have the time to care for him ex except to exploit his name whenever it's necessary for whatever means. And um, it's very, very sad the way they do it. And, uh, uh, little incidents in which I am involved very recently. I started this institute uh, in memory of grandfather and my parents in Memphis, Tennessee. And I wrote a letter to the Prime Minister of India, the present Prime Minister, asking him to donate through the government of India all the books um, written by and on Gandhi um, the videotapes and the films and uh, audio tapes and all the things that they have there. And that please make a copy of it and give it to me so that I can keep it in this institute and it will help in teaching young people the philosophy of nonviolence. 
And uh, I got a letter saying that he was sending it over to the relevant ministries and I will hear from them shortly. Well, I did hear from them a year later and they said, uh, we have passed all your uh, requests. You can take all these things, but we don't have the money to mail it to you, to ship it to you. So you'll have to make arrangements to ship it. You'll have to make arrangements for somebody to copy all the films and the photographs and all that, pay for the copies. And uh, so I said, okay, that's fine. I'll find some donor in the U.S. who can do it. And then two months later, I read in the newspapers that the government of India has started a Nehru Center in London and they've sent, spent three million dollars there to renovate the building and to, um, you know, make, spruce it up. And they're now shipping all the furniture required for that center from India at the expense of the government. Uh, your grandfather's philosophy represents a yeah. threat to the present day rulers of India mm. as well as other oppressive uh, governments mm. all over the world. And they just do not want to support social movements and social activism that threatens the status quo. Whereas Nehru is a westernizer, a moderate politician, as mm -hmm. he turns out to be, who is very pro-British in certain uh, ways, oh, yeah. as evidenced by the fact that in London they're having this uh, center. Mm -hmm. So it's not terribly surprising. Let's um, conclude the discussion with talking about how you came to the United States. You were involved in these struggles in India that you told us in detail about to help the villagers and particularly the untouchable uh, class and fight the caste system. What led you to leave India and to come to the United States? Well, I had all these experiences in India and in South Africa and uh, especially in India where I used grand grandfather's philosophy very effectively in bringing about these social and economic changes there. And I thought that that was um, something that I needed to share with other people. And um, there was an American friend who was visiting India. This was in 82, 83. And I just got to talking to him about this work and uh, he came and saw the work that we were doing and was very impressed by it. And, um, and while we were talking, the idea came into my mind, why not write a book comparing these uh, attitudes um, in South Africa, India, and the United States. One place you have the racial discrimination, in another place the caste discrimination, and in the third place the color discrimination. Compare this and, and find nonviolent solutions to it and write a book on it. And he was very uh, you know, taken up by the idea and he said, uh, if you'd like to come to the U.S. and do that, I could make it possible for you. So. He um, arranged for a fellowship for one year to come here and do it. And that's how I came here in 87. And uh, while working on that project in Mississippi, um, the media heard about me and, uh, and uh, I started getting invited by universities to speak and all that. And so after the fellowship ended, we just extended our stay with this money that I was earning through speaking engagements and at the same time working on the in the book there and uh, one thing led to another and then in 88 my mother died and uh, that's when i went to south africa to be by her side and that was the first time i saw the uh, gandhi institute in south africa totally destroyed and demolished um. It was a double tragedy for me. It was, on one hand, I lost my mother, and uh, I see their life's work was all in ashes, uh, you know. Someone had burned it down? Yeah, yeah. The, it was the government and the Inkata together, mm -hmm. you know, conspired to demolish it. So I was thinking of starting an institute uh, for the study of nonviolence. Initially, the idea was to do it in South Africa, sort of replacement of this institute that was uh, destroyed, and just to uh, you know inform young people of alternative ways of dealing with uh, conflicts there. 
But uh, South Africa wasn't ready for it. They didn't accept the idea and there were a lot of political hassles in 88, so I gave up the idea. And lots of my friends here in the academic world, they said, if you can't do it in South Africa, why don't you do it here? It's needed anywhere in the world. So I uh, looked around here and uh, in the Christian Brothers University in Memphis, a very small university heard about it, so they offered us some hospitality and said that they didn't have the money, but they could, we could use the facilities. And I thought that was good enough. So I sold my grandfather's letters that I inherited from my mother. The original letters, a packet of about 67 letters. They were all uh, right from 1892 to 1948. And they were getting old and brittle and uh, you know, deteriorating very quickly. And I thought that uh, I wouldn't be able to preserve them. So if I could raise some money from that, uh, why not do that? And I did that last year. I auctioned them in London. But uh, that auction caused a little um, a controversy in India. The government of India accused me of commercializing Gandhi's name and all that. And so the price of the letters fell. Oh. And, but I got $56,000, and that was invested in this institute, which is what we are working with now. But now a lot of people locally have heard about it, that they are very sympathetic, and they give us donations. So we have been uh, working for the last one year in that institute, and I think we'll be able to do uh, quite a lot of work there. One of the things that we want to take up uh, I immediately is uh, 1994 is the grandfather's 125th birth anniversary. And I wanted to use that as a peg to uh, declare 1994 as a year of nonviolence to commemorate all the people all over the world who sacrificed uh, for the nonviolent uh, change, you know. And, uh, and simultaneously have programs to, uh, you know, inform people and educate people in nonviolent conflict resolution. Yeah. It's ironic that uh, his home country has turned his back on him, but the rest of the world has really embraced him and his philosophy. Yeah, and that's it? what I was saying, that the rest of the world has, respects him. And, and uh, How is this, uh, how do you see this happening in various different parts of the world? the impact? Well, I think it's been tremendous and uh, and wherever I've been outside India, the, the interest in Gandhi and the, in his philosophy and all that has been tremendous and we can see it in everyday life. I mean, the influences in Eastern Europe and all over the place, uh, changes have been taking place in a non-violent manner and much of that has been his influence uh, one way or the other. And do you envisage participating in some nonviolent social change and activism projects in the United States? As you well know, Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement was deeply influenced by your grandfather's teaching. Do you see some contemporary projects that this might be applied in the United States? One of the things that I want to do very soon is to hold a conference of youth. Um, you know, we see... Um, the youth having many problems. There is uh, violence among the youth and, um, and, uh, and a lot of disaffection among drugs. the youth and drugs and all that. Now, all of these things tell me that there's a lot of frustration among the youth. But we have never consulted the youth about it. It's always the experts, the adults who analyze the problems of the youth and provide the solutions and, and those solutions are not accepted by the youth so uh, you know things just get worse and worse. Uh, what I want to do is to reverse the process. And they have this conference of the youth where the youth are going to talk. And they are going to help find, try to find some solutions. We can help them in whatever way they want to. But they must take the initiative and they must come up with the solutions there. And we adults must sit and listen to them. I think that's what we need to do in many things. There.
In fact, this is what I've been trying to uh, explain to many of the civil rights leaders uh, and uh, also people in Memphis that uh, we now have to change our focus from protesting to uh, doing something positive. I mean, for long we have been protesting and protesting and protesting. You know, let's get down to doing something positive ourselves and not wait for the government to do things. You're watching Alternative Views. And now we have some news stories from the Alternative Press. In World Press Review for October of 1992, an article by Jan Urban, who's a former Czechoslovak dissident, and he's writing in a Hungarian uh, newspaper or magazine. He talks about the great significance which and results which could occur with the demise of Czechoslovakia, with Slovakia, the eastern part of the country, breaking off and becoming a separate uh, country. For one thing, to increase its energy supply and political prestige, the Slovak Republic may soon reroute the Danube River away from the border it forms in Hungary and have it go into uh, Slovak territory. Well, there's an awful lot of Hungarian nationalist activity, and they can be propelled to power by a campaign of rights for their oppressed brothers. They're talking about that right now because there are more than a half million Hungarian people in Slovakia. But it goes even further than that. The uh, Hungary has treaties with Czechoslovakia, but none with Slovakia. So they could say, well, they, we have treaties with a country that no longer exists. They would demand something, uh, some uh, retribution or some territory where these uh, uh, Hungarians are in the territory is now Slovakia. The same argument could be used by Ukraine to demand a territory from the easternmost part of Slovakia. And the democratic forces in these countries might challenge these arguments, but they may be called even naive or maybe even uh, unpatriotic. Now, there are groups advocating self-determination for ethnic Germans in the Czech region of Bohemia. And uh, then there are uh, ethnic uh, Hungarians living in Transylvania and Ukraine and Vojvodina and the former Yugoslavia, and they could demand a reuniting or a uniting with uh, Hungary. Uh, there in the Baltics, there are problems with ethnic Germans. The Russians also have some uh, Germans that are located around the Volga River. So the uh, article written by Jan Urban says that the importance of Czechoslovakia has always been that it has been considered and it considers itself as a multi-ethnic state. It's not a pure state. They have brought everybody in multinational demo uh, democracy, which is very important for Central European uh, area because of all the various nationalist groups that are there. But it may turn out now that this is nothing more than a senseless historical experiment, a useless adventure in democracy, if the Balkanization, not only of the Balkans, but of all of Central Europe, continues. Well, we reported recently how the Republican right at a religious convention to try to get the moral majority going again and to support the Republican 1992 ticket indicated that claims that there was an environmental threat from ozone depletion was a plot by atheists. <laughs> well, at the end of September, a very uh, startling uh, report came out that indicated that the depletion of ozone over Antarctica is starting earlier and occurring faster than last year. Scientists at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in Boulder, Colorado, said that ozone layers readings over the South Pole last week were 15 percent lower than similar readings that were taken during a comparable week last year in 1991. They indicated that they got these ozone uh, layer, these ozone readings through high altitude balloons and claimed that this month's reading may be a result of both man-made chemicals and sulfur dioxides that were ejected into the atmosphere in 1991 combined with volcanic eruptions 
from Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines and Mount Hudson in um, Chile. It also is to be taken account of, they suggested, that it is mainly man-made chemicals, mainly uh, chloro, uh, fluorocarbons that are used in refrigerators, air conditioners, and several industrial processes that are playing a major role in ozone depletion. So this de is a definite and a dangerous threat that's getting worse and that needs to have serious attention despite what the Republican right wing says. Well, during the Reagan-Bush administrations, there was one sector of employment that was on the rise. What was that? Child labor. After ni nearly disappearing from American life for so many decades because of laws and because of uh, uh, relative po uh, prosperity, child labor is back and even the lack of jobs during uh, the recession doesn't seem to stem the tide. Investigators say the children are now working more and even more dangerous jobs. Federal statistics indicate that at least 4 million children, ages 14 to 18, are legally employed, but an estimated 2 million other children work illegally, either because their businesses or family members pay them cash uh, to avoid uh, taxes and minimum wages, or because they work too many hours, they work late hours in hazardous jobs, or because they're under 14 years of age and thus too young to be legally working at all. And that's Alternative Views for this time. Frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications which we use on Alternative Views and also a reading list for U.S. power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these, send a stamped, self-addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. You must send a self-addressed stamped envelope. We'd like to thank some people who helped make our program possible. Kevin was on the camera, and we received editing assistance from Joelle, Dina, and Ashley. Alternative Views is a presentation of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. We'll give you time to jot that down in case you'd like to uh, write to us. Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Goodbye.